Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the home stretch of Saturday. Thanks for being here at Crypto and Privacy Village. We've got another fantastic talk lined up. Ken Gears, senior research scientist at Komodo, is going to run us through traffic analysis in cyberspace. All the cybery cybers. Thanks, Ken. Give it up. All right. Awesome. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, so I'll just, I think the most important takeaway from this talk uh, is that, it, you know, the math works and it doesn't really matter how, uh, you know, how solid your crypto is if somebody can see what you're doing. You know, if somebody basically knows, you know, if they're looking for you especially. But, but given ubiquitous surveillance and sensors today, um, you know, often people just can see who you are and where you are, and, and we'll get to that in just a second. But uh, I'm, I'm sort, of, sort of have an intelligence background, so I kind of look at, at things with a, an international relations perspective, so a geopolitical perspective, and that's what I've done at government for 20 years and then with a couple of uh, companies as well. So, uh, who knows what pizza and the Pentagons have in common? Yes. Exactly. So, you know, if you're a journalist, you can sit out at, at two in the morning outside the Pentagon and just count the number of pizza deliveries. And if, it, if it's average 200, and then on one night it's 20,000 pizzas, the largest office building in the world, something is probably happening that you might want to be interested in, right? So, and then if you go to Alan Turing in World War II, uh, you know, when the Japanese fleet set sail for Pearl Harbor, well, they kept the communications going as much as possible as normal, even though the ships weren't there. When we invaded uh, um, France on D-Day from, from Normandy, uh, we had all kinds of fake things happening. We wanted the Nazis to think that we were going to invade to the left, and we went to the right, right? And the same thing is on the Enigma machine from the German perspective. The Germans had great faith in the Enigma for a long time because the math was sound. You know, if, you know, if it's trying to find one star in a universe of billions, you know, it's pretty good. The problem, though, is, is in the process, right? And Gary Kasparov, if you heard his talk yesterday, he talked about this. He said it's all in the process. He said, honestly, he said a very average intelligence person with a, with a smartphone can beat almost the best chess players today if they just know how to operate the phone well and they don't question the wisdom of the phone. So, uh, so it's all about intelligence, but it's, uh, you have to have a smart people. And like with Bletchley Park and Alan Turing, there were thousands of people supporting him, doing HUMINT and SIGINT uh, and all kinds of other intelligence operations behind them. So just a couple of slides on this. You know, if you have a whole bunch of traffic, right, on your network or in your country um, or in your home even, um, you can usually figure out, if you, just, if you just start sorting it out, who's in charge, right? In other words, chain of command. Uh, and by timing, you can see when things happen that are important. Right? And so that's how a lot of attribution, I spent years in the basement of the Pentagon trying to do attribution for these big intrusion sets that DOD looks at. Well, one of the basic ways to do that is time. We, you know, it, you, you take the majority of the traffic and you say, okay, between nine and five, where is it happening work time wise? Okay, here, this intrusion set is nine to five Beijing time. This is Moscow time. This is Maryland time. Aha, okay, here we have sort of the APTs sorted out, right? And so, if, and again, if you, you imagine yourself sort of in a bunker uh, in World War II, you know, with headphones on, you know, it's the frequency of the communications, um, the volume of communications. And a lot of times, this is going to give away even things like SSH and TLS. Uh, security protocols on the Internet, are, are, they're subject to basic time and size and frequency attacks, right? Just depending on how often you're communicating and with whom you're communicating, a lot of times the metadata is enough. You don't even really want the content, right? Because content just slows you down. Uh, it's hard enough, I can tell you, I was a linguist at NSA. Uh, it's hard enough to understand, a, for a person to understand what somebody else is saying, especially on the other side of the world, in a different context, a different language, it's even harder for computers, right? You know this from the Turing test. So the metadata is really what you want, and you want to be able to chew on that you know, algorithmically, and you, you, you can almost know uh, more, quicker, faster, better without the content. 
So back and forth might be communications and random, might be security or some kind of operation. You know, rapid, slow silence, right? If, if all kinds of data is flooding all of a sudden, well, something important is happening. If there's no communications, well, guess what? That also might signal something very interesting. Let's say you're following a spy, you're counterintelligence, uh, and then all of a sudden communications are completely broken. Maybe there's an important operation going on, right? Then that's, 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 uh, that's an important takeaway from no comms. So then on, the, on countering basic signals intelligence or traffic analysis, how do you do it on defense, right? So one of the basic ways is to burst communications. So over the course of a month, you know, if I, if I fire off some this morning and then next Thursday, and then that's it, I'm hoping you're gonna not be listening at the right time. So it's all about when you're listening. Spread spectrum is all about where you're listening. You know, there's a range of frequencies. And so I shoot one up here, one down here, and one down here. You know, you're only going to get part of it, right? Indirect communications are very important because like at the Pentagon way back when, 15 years ago, oh, let's say okay, Chinese intrusion sets or whatever intrusion set, you know, coming from the Pentagon, they're not going to take the data directly back, right, to headquarters. Uh, but it's going to go to Maryland or go to Virginia, go to Canada first, right? Cyberspace, there's only one cyberspace and only one internet, right? And we're all in the same space together. So that gives attackers all kinds of possibilities because I don't know if I have it in this presentation, but I have a slide basically of all the C2 comms over about a, a six month period. And there's connections between any two countries on the planet. So what does that mean? If you're a really smart hacker, you can route it a different way every time, right? Buried fiber, like in Iraq, this gave NSA for a long time, you know, all kinds of headaches. You know, you, you, you digitize communications, you put them underground, very hard uh, to find it. Now, one of the only ways really to get around, theoretically, traffic analysis is by continuous ciphertext. So just, you know, encrypt everything to the nth degree and then fire it 24-7, 365 at full volume. And why is that the only way to get around traffic analysis? It's because then somebody can't do timing attacks, frequency attacks, size attacks against your, your traffic, right? And failing all else, there's human courier. But then again, that's the silence problem, right? So in Abbottabad, Pakistan, you know, when the CIA is trying to find Osama bin Laden, and that huge house on the corner has no telephone, no internet uh, communications, well, guess what? Silence is in and of itself a huge red flag, right, if you're on the hunt for someone. So if you work for a big company, you probably also have a, a picture like this of the world. You know, this is malware detections for the past few months uh, that I've been looking at. And I really enjoy it because uh, the company I work at now, we've got, we actually have clients in every country on the planet uh, because you can download and use software for free, security software. So what, that, what does that mean? In every, every little island and, uh, and province and city and state, I get malware uh, traffic to analyze. You know, but all of these, they kind of lie outside your, your sovereignty and law enforcement jurisdiction, so you have to think of some other ways to, to, to get at this. Um, and so if you plot it as a network, same data, uh, but you plot it as on a network chart, uh, then you get a different picture. And again, here you can see, ah, you know, the sovereignty and jurisdiction are not so important anymore because we're all in the same cyberspace to some degree. Uh, so the malware analysts at my company, they put things in categories like Trojan, application malware, etc. And I think more in terms of countries. So all these little orange circles around the side are, you know, Netherlands, Iran, Latvia, etc. You can see where we have most of our detections, Russia, US, Germany, etc. But what you can see here uh, is that... Uh, this is truly an international problem that requires an international solution from a from a uh, from a, a legal policy perspective. But as a as an analyst, uh, you know you you can do a lot with this too by clicking on you know your country and your particular uh, malware type, and all of a sudden you blow it up and you make it you simplify the problem. And here's our top five uh, for the spring malware types along with the top 10 countries for each. And then you color code them a little bit and you can see where most of our detections are in Russia uh, and the United States. And, uh, and you, you can work out from there. Uh, so application is a huge malware category for us. We have 
you know, uh, unwanted application, potentially unwanted application, malicious application, et cetera. So I threw those out, just take these four for this particular analysis. Uh, but you can see Trojan is, is the, not only the largest, but it's the most complex uh, data set. Over the coming year, I really want to do something on analysis of complexity versus simplicity. Uh, and Trojan is, is a tough one because of the, it's the, you know, the Swiss army knife. As you, when you get that code on your system, any, you, know, you can do ransomware, you can do basically uh, anything. But it, so it's, it's, it's the largest, and as you'll see in a second, it's also the most complex. Uh, and it's also, as you'll see, backdoor, I think, is the most valuable uh, category. So here, um, if you sort, for example, and I'll show you a little bit of this, but countries by the ratio of these four malware types, according to the ratio within each country, um, backdoor is, oh, they're all very rich countries at the highest ratio. And worm is all the very poorest countries. And I'll show you a little bit of that in a second. But with these four malware types, I can show you we have every country on the planet. There's, there's you know, 190 some odd countries in the UN, but there's 255 um, country code top level domains. Uh, but that's kind of the way I sort them. And there's a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of fun ones. If you like geography, you'll find that there's some little semi autonomous and quasi um, uh, independent republics in various places that you can find on the map. Um, but here's another way to sort your data that's really helpful, because here's what I want to say also in this presentation. You can do anything, I think, with traffic analysis. You just need to just keep changing your perspective, thinking about the attacker's perspective, the defender's perspective, but also conceptual ideas like what vertical. Vertical is kind of a buzzword, but, but here, so you put our clients into particular um, economic sectors, basically healthcare, education, et cetera. And what you'll find is you can fingerprint malware types and families, threats, threat actors, you know, ever more precisely. And so you don't have to defend against everything, but you can defend only against some things. Now this is only obviously a partial data set, but I think it's already pretty revealing so for my data, over the past six months, I've started to put them into uh, malware, uh, you know, verticals, then malware types, and malware families. Uh, but what you find is if you work out from there, and you can go the other direction too, and that also is interesting, but I only have so much time here. But like online services, for example, all the ones I've been able to look at so far have been in the worm category. And then those have been mostly in just two malware families, Nimda and Runounce. Right? So very quickly you say, well, if I do online services, I better take care of this one. At least start here. Uh, because you know, there's, there's quantity and there's quality. And quality sometimes trumps quantity. But um, as, uh, as you've probably heard, quantity has a quality all its own. Right? So you have, to, you have to deal with the big stuff first, the elephant in the room. Sorry? Oh, thank you. Yeah, quote from Stalin. So I've lived most of the past decade in the former Soviet Union. So thank you for sharing that with me. Um, here's our African traffic. And the, the list goes away on down, because there are like 60 some odd countries in Africa. But this is one way you can do it. So this is in Kibana, Elastic Stack, but you, you can use anything. Uh, and I just said, OK, for each of the countries, I want to see the top spike over the last you know, month or two uh, for this data. And so that's really interesting because you can click on one at a time and open it up and see what was the, what was the spike. So where was the outbreak? Where was the largest amount of infections for a given uh, country? Um, and then over time, time is kind of your best friend sometimes as an analyst too because you can see, you know, it happened on Christmas or New Year's or Valentine's Day or whatever it was. Uh, and why is that? And you can also sort, you know, by time of day. So this traffic is from the Middle East. Uh, I took six countries in the Middle East. Um, and again, so this is kind of like the network perspective. This is uh, malware detections, OK? Now I'm going to drop something else on there. You can see I dropped, I went back and I said, OK, for each of these countries, is there something interesting that happened at that time? And I can't promise you these things are directly related, but I happen to firmly believe, because I have more of a government background, so that's the way I think. Um, but I happen to think that there's a whole lot of nation state operations going on in cyberspace, many more than we imagine. Uh, so in this case, the red on the left is Saudi Arabia detections. And I looked, and on that day, or right about that day or two, there was a missile fired from Yemen at, at Mecca. In Yemen, on that same day, there was a bomb that killed 48 soldiers. 
In Egypt, there was a church bomb. In Turkey, you probably remember this, which was big in the news. This is New Year's Day here. Um, there was a bomb at a discotheque in Istanbul that killed almost 40 people. Uh, that was also the biggest spike. And then over here, there's a cluster of them. And I said, well, what happened around here? And you just go back in Google News to look at what was happening at that time. And there was a, uh, a missile, uh, in a test in Iran that may have been of interest to all these countries. May or may not be related directly, but I th here's the way I put it. I think a combination of law enforcement, uh, domestic intelligence, foreign intelligence, hacktivist, lone hacker, cyber criminal, various things, basically. Uh, they, you know, you, I think there is a relationship at least to some degree. So I was at a company about five years ago, or, well, only three years ago now. And so, and I did an 18-month study on uh, malware callbacks. And here's what I said, okay, there's a to and a from. And I think the, the to, the person receiving the callback is gonna get greater weight, right? So let me, th let me see the malware callbacks to a particular country. I'm just gonna plot them all. And I had 30 million rows of data over an 18 month period. I'm not sure quite how many are on this screen, maybe 18. But on the, the, the yellow column on the right is March 2014. And in March 2014, um, was a very critical month, I think, in geopolitics. Because I presented this at um, Black Hat 2014. Um, and so in March of that year, it, um, Russia annexed Crimea and had troops on the border. Uh, Gazprom, the big Russian uh, company, was threatening um, an oil shutoff to Ukraine. Uh, the West was threatening sanctions against Russia. And so my own belief is that, that basically cyberspace is just a reflection of traditional human affairs. You'll never find an election or a military invasion um, that is not reflected in network traffic and also in your malware data, right? If you happen to be within that sort of geopolitical fault line. So here you can see the blue is you, um, callbacks to Ukraine from anywhere in the world. Uh, red is callbacks to Russia from anywhere in the world. And the Russian is not so clear because there, I think, there is, as you'll see in a second, there's, Russia is riddled with malware. There's a lot of other countries are too. But the single highest amount, see, this is the, court, the, the, this, this was the month, the, the yellow, uh, of the, the peak tension, international tension. And you can see Ukraine basically rising up in the data to that particular uh, point. And uh, so anyway, but I think there that it's pretty clear even eyeballing it. I'm not Alan Turing, but the, um, even just looking at the, uh, at the data, you can tell. So in the data I'm looking at for this, the last few months, I'm also, I'll show you a couple of ways that I'm trying to analyze it. And this is, uh, this, is th this spring, this is April, May, and June. And basically, these four malware categories I was showing you earlier, there's just wild swings in them. And this is global data. This is, you know, this is a, um, you know, there's about a billion rows of data and about 50 million that have been tagged by our malware analysts into a particular category. Uh, but you can see that, that w there's a huge outbreak of worm and then tapers off. Uh, and, you know, people figure out the, uh, the exploits and the vulnerabilities and shut them off. Uh, and say virus going back to the number one or the number two at the end of the category. Trojans are maintaining pretty solid, you know, number one overall, uh, and, and less with virus. You can also say, where did these infections take place? Uh, and so you, you though by country code here, and then also you can see where those worm infections largely were in the Philippines and Indonesia uh, on the left, right? And that gets less as, as other countries then, you know, take... Uh, take that room. Uh, but Russia there in the middle is the third country, uh, and you can see big spikes. Uh, May 29th, I don't know, but what happened on May 29th, if you're a Russia analyst, you, you may be able to uh, associate that with le legislation, uh, with international tension, with domestic politics. You know, it could just be pure cybercrime. But then again, I'm not always Sure, there's such a thing as pure cybercrime that has no collect, uh, connection to what's happening uh, in politics. Uh, but here you can see, and, and, and ideally you want to be able to open these up, right, and look inside them. So here I plot a Trojan worm virus in backdoor on this tree map. And so you can see by country code uh, the top. And we'll just look at the top. This is a short presentation, so we'll just look at the number ones of anything. Uh, but if we highlight 
uh, the number one country for each malware type, I think you'll be able to see something that's pretty, very interesting. Uh, the US has a particular problem with Trojans, uh, but you can see that Trojans have, uh, they, they've occupied an interest, so if you, if you say, what is the relative ratio between countries, you'll see that the United States scores very low on worm and virus, but top on Trojan. So I think it's a higher value, higher return on investment, more targeted uh, operation in cyberspace. Here you can see uh, worm, the Philippines, but the Philippines, then they drop way down on, on Trojan, further down on virus, and not, you know, at least in this short bit, top on back door. Uh, but, but it's a, 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 um, a worm is a lower category of cyber attack. It's, it's, it's going after the low hanging fruit in cyberspace, unpatched, unmanaged, unlicensed, the easy pickings, right? So here, virus. Russia, even though Russia is well known for kind of being an aggressive player in cyberspace, you can see that they have all kinds of trouble on their networks. There's no doubt about that. It's number two on Trojan, uh, number two, two on Worm, and number one on Virus. So, so really enough said, I think. And if you look at Poland, which came in number one on Backdoor, a little bit less on the others. But, but the fact that it comes in number one in our, our very strategic data set in terms of Backdoor is something they should look at. These are families. So once you get into the particular families of, uh, of each malware type, then you can get more precise, right? Whether you're on offense or defense, because uh, those are kind of one and the same, in a sense. Uh, so here, you can see the US occupying, again, a very high ra ratio of the detections here. This is um, a virus, you can see Russia, Russia, Russia here. It's a, uh, it's a lower, in the worm category, you can see Philippines, Indonesia, but also Russia, 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 right? So this is very important. I think these networks have a lot of work to do. You can see Dark Comet here is our top uh, back door. Also, the previous company I was at, also the top back door uh, was Dark Comet. But you can see that this is a higher re value, higher return on investment data set. Poland, Singapore, US, Great Britain, Great Britain, India. And if you look at it here, you can see um, if you just start with backdoor, you can see Australia, Great Britain, Japan, the top countries. Trojan, you look at the top, top ones here. This is by ratio, US, um, Great Britain, Australia. And worm, I'll just skip down to the bottom, South Africa and Russia. You can see it pretty clearly. And you can sort of plot it on a map. And again, basically, this is strategic traffic analysis. But I think it applies in a smaller micro context, too, within your, within your office, your, your home, your enterprise, uh, your vertical in your country, within countries. But you can see globally, if you plot the, 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 the top malware types by color on the screen, you'll see that there are patterns. Um, I'm approaching the end of my time, but you can see here the most people with the most money with the most malware in the United States, basically on this graph. Uh, and here also this further sort of strengthens my argument. Worm, you can see uh, the bubble size is per capita income. And as you go uh, higher ratio worm, these are smaller economies. Higher ratio backdoor, larger economies. Ransomware. Uh, here you can look at it by month, and you can see the United States crawling through the data uh, at the beginning of the year. This is January, February, March, April, and May. You can see Russia, Russia, Iran, Poland, the U.S. And my theory here is that they're practicing malware, they're experimenting with it, and they're, they're working it out uh, into the uh, richer economies with practice. So thank you very much. I'm out of time, but I appreciate your, your time and attention. So thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email.